All right, so like I said, there's going to be three of us covering this section. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on getting started in beef cattle. Um, we have a nutritionist here that can um, answer more specific questions on nutrition. And then David Peary, who you've been hearing from today, uh, grew up on a dairy farm, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about milking cows. All right, so getting started. Um, I'll go through uh, just the basics here. So this is just giving you a taste of all these things. There will be more advanced classes for those of you that have been doing it for a while. All right, so the purpose of cattle, what are we doing with them here, right? Um, dairy cows and beef cows are very, two very different animals, all right? How much do you need, right? So homesteading, you know, this is for mostly the purpose of um, growing our own food for our families, right? So we're going to consider this. Um, how many gallons of milk does your family drink a week, right? How much beef do you eat, right? How much storage space do you have available, All right? So I'm going to go through this, and actually there's someone here that's going to talk about meat processing, but um, live weight, right? So that's what an animal weighs when it's alive standing in the field, right? Then there's something called hanging weight, right? Once you've taken out all the guts, all the head, the skin, right? What does the actual carcass weigh, right? And then the yield is after it's all cut up, right? How much meat did that produce? Now there's a whole lot of variables in this, but Let's say, right, that you have a 1,200 pound cow slaughtered, right? It's still going to be like 500 pounds of meat, right? It's going to take a pretty good sized deep freezer, right? Because you can freeze it and use it all year round, right? But you're going to have to invest in having the ability to store it, right? Dairy cattle, you can get some of these high producing dairy cattle producing eight gallons of milk a day, right? My family goes through a lot of it, but not that much, right? So we're gonna kind of consider these things going in, right? You might not need the heaviest producing cow, right? So kind of, like I said, I'm starting really, really basic. So some of you guys know this and, right, you guys can just take a break for a minute. So in the cattle industry, there's a whole lot of jargon, people using terms, right? And if you're not used to it, you're like, what are you even talking about? Is that English, right? But kind of the phases of an animal's life we're going to go through, right? So there's cow-calf operations, right? That's where you keep the mama cows, they have a calf once a year, and that's what you do, right? Feeder calves. Right? When you start talking about feeders and stalkers, right? buying in calves when they're weaned, right? take the calves away from mama, and you just take them through that big growth phase. Right? Buy them right after they're weaned and take them up till they're almost ready to slaughter. Right? This will also be called a grower phase. This is when they're doing the most of their growing. Finishing, a finishing operation. Right, that's gonna be that last two months before slaughter when you're finishing them, getting them ready to eat. Right, and you'll have your bred cows, right? Some people call these springers, right? But they're gonna be the cows that are pregnant, right? And then your lactating cows. If you're gonna have multiple um, stages of life, you're going to have to have multiple pens. You know, we kind of talked about this with the sheep and goats, but you know, you don't have the same nutritional requirements for a 300 pound calf as you do an 800 pound calf, right? And if you have an 800 pound calf and a 300 pound calf in the same field, right? And you throw out a bucket of feed, right? That 800 pound calf's not going to be Go first, I insist. That doesn't happen, right? They're going to both go after the feed, and the bigger one's going to be eat it all, and the little one won't have a chance, right? So we're going to have to separate them according to stages of life. So just because you could potentially have this many per acre, if you're keeping multiple life stages, you're going to have to have multiple pens, and that's going to cut down on it, 
right? We're gonna try to be efficient when we do this. Fencing requirements, all right? I'm not gonna harp as much. They're not as bad to keep in as goats are, right? But the perimeter fence, once again, good fences make good neighbors, right? Um, internal fencing, right? Consider if you want it mobile, right? If you're gonna do rotational grazing, you can get some electric fences and move them. Cattle do very, very well with electric fences. Right, some exceptions to that is when it's time to wean them, right? You're taking the baby away from mama. It wants its mama. Mama wants her baby, right? You're gonna have to have a good strong fence separating them there, right? If you're gonna be keeping your bull away from young heifers, right, that aren't big enough to be bred, once again, you need a strong fence, right? A vet I used to work for always said, where there's a will, there's a way, right? And especially when you start talking about breeding, if they want it bad enough, right, they'll test that fence. <laughs> we had that last windstorm. I'm not going to lie, my, my old cows were on the honor system for about two weeks because the electric fence wasn't hot. They just didn't figure it out, right? That could happen. Now, those weanling calves, right, they would have, like kids, They'll push it, they'll test it, right? So what kind of animals are you raising? All right, so as we went through, like I said, the animals got bigger all day. You know, I showed you pictures of that sheep throwing it up on its butt and it's yours. Cattle, that's not true anymore. We're gonna have to have handling facilities, right? I, I remember once back in practice, I showed up to a farm because a farmer had a cow that was limping. I'm like, out there, she's in the middle of this 40-acre field. And he's like, Doc, she's limping. And I said, she sure is, isn't she? You know, what am I going to do? Go chase her with a rope? Right? At some point, you're going to have to get them up. So you're going to have to have some kind of handling facilities here. Right? Safety first. These things are going to be big enough to hurt you. Right? You're going to want them gentle enough so they don't try it. But at some point, you're going to have to get them up for something, right? But you don't have to have the Cadillac version for two cows, right? This is where we're going to come back to the more practical applications. So up here in these pictures, so what you see on the bottom is a full chute. Right? So this picture. All right, so that cow is in a full chute. There's a palpation cage where you can get behind her. The sides come down. You can do anything you want. That's really efficient, right? And behind that, there's a whole system of these big gates that lead her in. If you've got two or three cows, that's not practical. But I did say you've got to have something. So the top picture, right, that's just a head catch or a head gate. Right? So that bottom picture probably cost like ten, twelve thousand dollars. That picture on the top, right, that's probably about fifteen hundred. Right? And plus the wood. Um, you can always get with your local extension agent, you know, in bottom out and be like, you know, what what do you recommend here? Right? Ask for help when you're designing it. But if you just have two or three um, you're going to be much more economical just to get a head gate, right? You're going to have to have somewhere where you can get them up, but it doesn't have to be the Cadillac version, right? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to get on a little bit of a soapbox here. All right, Tommy, give me two minutes on this. All right, so antibiotics and hormones, all right? A lot of people want meat grown organically, and I, I, I do too, right? If you don't have to use antibiotics, don't. But sometimes you have to, right? So here's some things to consider, right? I believe in less need for antibiotics and more of them when needed, right? And that those two concepts aren't contradicting each other, right? Antibiotics should never be a replacement for good management. Right, we're not just going to leave them out in fill, not take care of them, and throw antibiotics at them if they do get sick, right? 
we're going to do what we can do to prevent them from getting sick in the first place. We're going to vaccinate, right? We're going to use biosecurity. We're going to do everything we can to prevent them from getting sick, right? But at some point, anything can happen, right? You send your kid to school and it gets threat, strep throat. You don't just turn it out, right? Right? <laughs> but we are going to be responsible about it, right? <laughs> okay, I lied, All right? Who's heard of a withdrawal time? Does anybody know what that is? So when you have a bottle of antibiotics that's labeled for animals, it has on every bottle, it has a withdrawal time. It has been tested and tested and tested to see how long it takes that antibiotic to get out of that animal system. Most of them are about a month, right? And it is illegal to sell that animal until you've observed that withdrawal time because we don't want antibiotics in the food chain. If you give a shot of antibiotics and it has a 28-day withdrawal, that animal is not to be slaughtered until the antibiotics have got out of its system, right? Beef quality assurance, where we give the antibiotics, right? We're going to give the antibiotics in the neck because that's going to get trimmed out when we go to slaughter it. We're not going to put it in the most expensive cuts. We're going to put it somewhere where it can be trimmed out. Right? But you need to have a plan. Like I said, it's great to want to grow things organically. But if you have a calf and you feed that calf for a year and then it gets sick, you've got to give it antibiotics. Are you going to start over? Right, you can. You can be like, okay, I didn't want to have antibiotics, treat it and sell it to somebody else, get a new calf, right? But that's a whole lot of meat, right? You're gonna to have to kind of think about this one ahead of time. And if you work with some of your organic associations, most of them, um, vaccines are still, can still be given to certified organic animals. Um, some dewormers can and some can't. Um, so if you're working with any kind of organic association, they can tell you what's on their list of do's and don'ts. Okay, that wasn't too bad, All right? So facility requirements. Um, are you doing bottle calves, feeder calves, um, or finishing? All right. So bottle calves, um, it really just depends. So what you see, I love that little jacket, isn't that cute? Right? So that's a dairy calf, right? So dairy calves are usually pulled off their mothers at two days old, right? Because they're drinking the profits. So you can buy some dairy bull calves very cheaply, right? But then you're going to have to bottle feed them, right? Which is still okay. A lot of times that's easy. You know, it's, a, it's somewhere where you can go buy the calves and then raise them, right? And take them all the way from two days old till slaughter, right? You don't want to get too attached, right? But, you know, male dairy animals, right, they can't produce milk, so they're usually just in the way, right? I think I go through this a little bit more. Purchasing from a reliable source. So most of those dairy farms, actually, that's a good, pl good place that you can buy them. You're starting fresh. Um, you're going to take, and like I said, you'll take them all the way up. Now, if you're buying calves that are weaned, beef calves, beef calves are going to have more meat. That's why they're beef breeds, right? A lot of times those are raised by their mother and weaned when they're about six, five to six months old, right? And if you can buy those directly off somebody's farm, let's say I know David down the road. I know David, he takes care of his animals. He does a really good job with them. If I can go straight to him and be like, hey, do you have a calf? And buy it directly off him, that's the best way to do it. But some of you guys might know, not know someone like that. A lot of calves are bought from stockyards, right? So in this picture, you know, cows as far as the eye can see. There's a lot of respiratory viruses that are super contagious. I talked about it earlier. Talked about keeping them two fences when you bring them in. I'm not going to repeat all that, right? But you can see when animals are in this close of quarters, if you've got one animal that's contagious in that pen, how many is it going to expose, 
right? And like I said, not to say that stockyards are bad because they're convenient, they're efficient, right? You know, the large commercial farmers can go in there and buy 200 calves at a time, right? 50 of them came from over here and 20 here, so it is efficient, especially for the larger producers, but realize that there's a lot of diseases that will go through stockyards, right? Even if the animal was healthy when it got there, it was exposed to everything, right? Your kids go back to school in the fall, right? They hadn't been sick all summer, and then they get strep throat, and then they've got COVID or whatever the disease going around happens to be, right? So always quarantine. If you buy them from somewhere like this, right, you're gonna be ready for them to have picked up something, right, and you're gonna quarantine them when you get them in. Right. So calves, I'm gonna start, okay, so I'm gonna kinda start at baby level and then we're gonna take them up. So calves are born 60 to 80 pounds. Some Holsteins, Charlies are bigger, right? So dairy calves, make sure they get colostrum, right? If someone's th offering to sell you a dairy calf, right? That's question number one. If it hasn't had colostrum, you don't want it. Right? That colostrum is what its immune system depends on for the first six months of life. If, it, if you don't know for sure that it had colostrum, don't buy it, right? Because if they don't get the colostrum, they'll be able, <clears throat> they're very likely to die from any run-of-the-mill infection before they turn six months old, right? You're going to do a whole lot of doctoring and a lot of problems, right? So dairy calves, you know, kind of the normal process is they're bottle fed twice a day usually, right? You, at about a week old, you'll start putting calf starter, which is a really high protein feed in front of them, getting them used to eating it, right? Most of the time they're in a very small pen where it's right there in front of them all the time, right, to get them used to eating. And early, they're usually early weaned because milk replacer is expensive. Right? Once you're watching them, once they've started eating that calf starter really good, and you've seen them eating hay, right? Then you can pull them off of the bottle, right? Now, in beef cattle, beef cattle, we let the cow do it because it's what nature intended and it's cheap, right? If that beef cow can turn grass right into ice cream, let her do it, right? If she's feeding it, I don't have to. Right? So in beef cattle, we let the natural processes go and we, um, we'll wean them between four to six months old, right? At that four to six months old phase, right, we're going to have had a creep feeder. A creep feeder is um, a feeder that's designed for small scale. You can actually get just a creep gate. So it's a gate that lets babies go in and out of it, but not mamas. So that way you can put feed out and the calves can come in and eat whenever they want, but the cows are locked out so she doesn't eat it all, right? Because when we start talking about weaning, it's not a recommended time, right? I'm not gonna tell you at this many days of age, it needs to be weaned, right? What I'm gonna ask you is if it's eating feed. If it's used to eating feed, you can wean it much earlier, like those dairy calves. But if it's never seen any grain before and you just pull it off mama, you don't know what to do with that, right? Right? You've got to have a smooth transition. Okay. They're yelling at me that we're behind, so I'm going to skip through some of these slides, right? Weaning is the most stressful time of the life, right? I just talked about that sudden feed change, right? I mean, it's emotionally stressful. I mean, imagine waking up one day and mama doesn't love you anymore. You're moved into a new pen. You're put in with new calves. There's usually a bully in that pen too that's picking on you, right? It is very, very stressful, right? So we're gonna make sure they're used to grain. They need high protein requirements because you know there's tons and tons of calories, lots of protein in milk, right? Milk is a really dense, um, caloric content, right? So that's what they're used to. When we pull them off that and they start eating grain, we're going to have to make sure that we've compensated 
right? That protein requirement, right? And it's rumen still developing, right? Those cows, they have this whole fermentation vat, right? Those calves, that, that their stomach is still developing. So we're gonna do it slowly, right? And we're gonna vaccinate them, which we'll get into in just a second, right? So dehorning, I told you earlier that goats, that we would dehorn the show weathers and the dairy goats. <clears throat> um, all cattle need to be dehorned, right? But cattle, my number one favorite way to dehorn cows is to do it genetically, right? So there's a, <laughs> right, let the, let the bull do it for you, right? So an animal is called polled. Right, a polled animal is born without, horn, or without horns, right? They will never grow horns, right? Dehorning is very, very painful. It's very bloody. It's very stressful, right? So if they just genetically never grow them, that's the way to do it. When you're looking at, you know, breeding animals, if you breed to a bull, that's polled or homozygous polled, right? His babies will not grow horns either because it's a dominant trait, which, um, so just always make sure that if you can breed polled animals, that's the way to go, like I said. And, <clears throat> right. so castration, once again, uh, male animals, if they're not intended to be used for breeding males, they should, they should be castrated. Ease of management. Right, I've talked several times today about having to have multiple pins, right? Once you castrate them, then you can run the steers with the heifers and you don't have to have those multiple pins, right? Because that, those heifers can't be around, You're, the male's not castrated until they're year and a half, right? So then you've got that whole grower phase where you can't allow her to get bred. Plus, it's gonna decrease the aggression, and it actually increases the meat quality too, right? I mean, think about it, you know, people take steroids to bulk up, you know, and you're like, well, that's a lot of muscle, but it's lean muscle, right? Castration can help the animals put on more fat, right? And fats, you know, that's what makes stuff taste good, right? Um, it makes tenderness. So I think they're gonna talk about in processing a little bit more too. Um, vaccines. So at weaning, they all need a respiratory vaccine, right? A modified life, right? And then three to four weeks later, another booster, right? After that, uh, vaccines are once a year, right? Those are all contagious viruses. Right? So what they call the black leg vaccine, right? Usually do black leg and tetanus, right? These are two types of bacteria that spores that are always in the environment. Um, black leg's one of those diseases, it's always in the environment. You won't have a problem with sev for several years. And then one day, you'll have multiple animals suddenly die from it. Um, so all animals, it's cheap. It's like a dollar a vaccine, right? Versus losing an 800 pound animal, right? It's a no brainer, right? Pink eye vaccine, this one's optional, right? Pink eye is spread by flies. So do you think you need it in the winter time? Probably not. There's no flies in the winter time, right? Even in the summertime, if you can control your, the weeds in your pasture, and you can control flies, it's still optional, right? Because with pink eye, what happens is when that animal's grazing, the cow's got their head on the ground, right? All those seed heads and the weeds are scratching them in the eye. And when that fly comes with bacteria, that starts the infection. So if you know that you can do a good job keeping flies down and keeping your pastures clipped, you might not need that vaccine. Also, with the beef quality assurance, I was talking about giving the shots in the neck, right? You can find some information online or video, more videos for beef quality assurance 
but it shows exactly where to give the vac vaccines, right in this little triangle, right? And when you give them in that spot, that can be trimmed out later. If a vaccine causes any scar tissue or something like that, it's not going to affect your expensive cuts of meat, right? So, right, we had the calf, right? Beef calf, wean, four or six months old, right? Then we're gonna take it through that grower phase. That's the stressful phase where they're just figuring life out, right? When they get up to somewhere about 900 pounds-ish, like I said, everyone's gonna have their own preference a little bit on this, of what size do you slaughter them at? Um, but once they get up to somewhere around 900 or 1,000, you're gonna go into a finishing phase. Right, if they're meat, if you're gonna turn them into meat animals. Right? So finishing is when you're going to increase the feed. Finishing is trying to get them fat, right? Marbling, what is marbling, right? Marbling is the fat that's within a meat. It's got a genetic component, but also some nutritional, right? Fat around the outside too. Fat gives steak flavor, right? That's why anything that tastes good can't be good for you, right? But by suddenly increasing the feed that last two months before you slaughter it, that's what you're trying to do is get the animal fat. And that fat is going to increase the tenderness and the flavor. Um, like I said, there's somebody processing talking right after us, right? But that's usually two to three months um, process. All right, processing, like I said, there's a whole nother talk coming, so I'm gonna go through this really quick, but I did have a couple pictures. Um, people wanna do things themselves, and there's a lot of things you can do by yourself. Um, and this is a client of mine that does do his own slaughter. It's not as easy as it looks. So when these things weigh 1,200 pounds, you can't just pick them up and hang them in a tree. It doesn't work, right? There's also beef to increase the tenderness, right? It hangs for one to two weeks, most of the time too, right? But it's gotta be in a refrigerator hanging, right? To get a refrigerator that big is not, is not that easy. You can do cool bots. So a cool bot's a little thing that you hook to an air conditioner and tricks it into overdrive, but it requires a lot more facilities and a ceiling hoist. Um, so doing it yourself is not as easy as you think. It's not just like cleaning a deer. All right, so if you have a cow-calf operation, um, artificial insemination versus natural breeding, right? So, I mean, that's a beautiful bull there, but he's gonna eat a lot, right? And you're gonna use him two minutes a year, right? Um, so it gets kind of expensive having a freeloader that's going to be that big. Right? Artificial insemination, if you only have two, is going to be the more practical way to go. Right now, you've got 20 cows. Yes, that'll justify having a bull around, right? But for one or two head, um, it's just not practical. When you sit down and put pencil to paper, it's not going to add up. Right, artificial insemination, you can take classes to become certified yourself and buy the equipment. Um, you can there have the semen, some semen companies have technicians that will come out and breed for you. Um, they usually have protocols of, you know, how to know that the cows in heat, you're gonna set them up by giving them certain hormones, getting them to come and heat at a certain time. Um, those are gonna be more specific. Um, talk with your local vet and they can usually tell you someone in the area that can help you if you don't want to do it yourself. Right? So gestation's nine months, right? Signs of calving, they usually go off by themselves, right? They'll be standing up, getting up, standing up, or laying down, getting up, laying down, getting up, and then when they lay down, start pushing, pushing, right? You should see progress within an hour. Right. Calves must get colostrum, right? Beef cow's pretty self-sufficient, 
right? Um, you know, as an animal of prey, you know, we think about predators versus prey animals, right? I mean, human babies, we can't walk for the first two years of life. And you think about the lion and the zebra, right? The lion doesn't have to get up. Mama's going to bring food back to the den, right? But cows are animals, are animals of prey, right? Most calves are able to get up and walk within an hour of birth, right? So you should see them up and nursing within a couple hours. If you don't, there might be a problem. Okay, like I said, I'm going to skip through some of this um, because of time. All right, weaning time, have good fences, right? The cow wants her baby too. Vocalization's normal, right? Um, you're going to, you may want to warn your neighbors because they're going to be bawling all night long. And so I usually do it on a weekend just in case, right? You're going to decrease the cow's nutritional requirements because at that point, you know, in some ways babies are kind of parasites, right? They're sucking all our nutrients. So once you get the calf weaned, her nutritional requirements will decrease. All right. All right, so this is always a big question, to buy a tractor or not. And, you know, look, I'm not a expert on machinery by any means and some of you guys out there might know more about this than I do but consider the use you know do you have also have a garden that you're tilling is there any other use for a tractor right so square bales can be handled right they can be picked up right but cows will go through a lot of them right but buying a tractor may be expensive you know if you have two cows does it justify buying, buying a $50,000 tractor, right? Maybe not. Um, the do, one thing I do want to warn people about that I've seen some people get hurt is trying to buy the, the little Kubota tractors, like the, you know, glorified lawnmowers, right? And then trying to pick up like a thousand pound bell of hay with it, don't work, right? So the compact tractors aren't big enough to pick up a bale of hay. All right, you can get some cheaper tractors that are used, um, but you realize you might be working on them frequently. So if you're somebody like me, that ain't gonna work either, right? Um, so you'll have to sit down, and it depends on how many head you have. If you have less than, you know, four cows. Square bales may be the best way to go just to save that expense. But then, like I said, are you also using the tractor for something else that can help justify that cost? I don't know. Anybody know more about machinery in here than me? All right. All right, we'll go with it. I, I mentioned it. <laughs> All right. So, hey, like I said, this is, you know, depending on if you have a tractor or not. Um, how big are the are the bales right square bales are convenient if you have you know two dairy cows that you're bringing them in anyway you can pick up the bales feed it easily right but if you're going to have 10 15 cows you're probably going to want to go ahead and buy that tractor right always put hay in a ring I had a farmer call me the other day and he actually had one of a, a or a goat a buck Right, that got killed because he didn't put the hay in a ring. And when he called me, I'm like, oh, well, you want me to come out and treat it? And he was like, no, it wicked witched the West and there's nothing but feet sticking out. It was over, right? And I could just see, you know, that house that dropped on the like wicked witch or whatever. So, you know, that 1200 pound bale of hay lands on a baby calf, it's done, right? It just squishes it. So always have some kind of containment around it. All right, feed storage. And this also comes to, you know, buying feed. It's always cheaper when you buy stuff in bulk. We even know that with the stuff we buy. But if half of it spoils, did you save any money? All right. So depending on how fast they're going through it, how many you have, you're not always better off buying it by the ton, right? You can buy it in 100 pound bags. If you just have one or two animals, that's what I recommend, right? 
depending on where you're storing it at, right? Or if it's humid, a lot of moisture in the environment. Once it begins to spoil, you get mold that can t be toxic or kill the animals, right? Um, so these are poly bins at the top. Those are pretty large, but you can actually buy some small ones. Um, this is a gravity bed wagon. Um, that can be expensive, but if you have, I don't know, 10, might be okay. Um, but if you have less than 10 cows, I, you know, I don't foresee buying over a ton. Um, probably 100, if you just have one or two, the 100 pound bags may be the way to go. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over to our nutritionist. I talked a little bit about buying the feed, but she can tell you actually what to feed. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So just, I wanna introduce myself first. So my name is Yun Jiang, and I'm a, a livestock nutritionist. So I work as assistant professor of livestock nutrition at KSU. Uh, we have a nutrition lab uh, at KSU. So what I do is um, beef cattle nutrition. That's my research major focus. And what I uh, research on is the rumen microorganisms and how do we uh, make the most efficient of the rumen microorganisms and how do we modify that and that improve the efficiency of animals. So my research also uh, focuses on reducing methane emission. Um, but for today's um, presentation, I will briefly talk about uh, how do we design a nutrition program for your beef cattle? Okay. Um, so first, uh, we want to, um, maybe can I borrow the microphone? That may be easier for me. Thank you. Yeah, that's better. Um, so to design the nutrition program, first we want to find out the nutrient requirements because if we do not know how much uh, nutrients the animals actually require, then how do we, how do we know if we're um, supplementing enough, right? So how do we find out the nutrient requirements? Um, there are several ways we can do that. Uh, first, we can refer to like the NRC nutrient requirements of beef cattle. Um, so that's like the um, textbook for nutrient requirements and you can find all the numbers like how much protein they need, how much energy they need uh, for the specific type of animals depends on their body weight, if they're milking and if they're growing. So that gives comprehensive information. But if you do not have access to the, um, that textbook, then you can look for extension publications online. So if you just Google like nutrient requirements for beef cattle, then you can find uh, various extension publications from different universities. So I have accumulated some um, good, great extension publications throughout the year uh, from different universities. So if um, you can just email me and I, can, um, I will share with you what I have. Then um, the second step is we need to take into consideration the different stress periods. For example, um, in the winter when it's really cold, then just like human, we need additional food, right? So a lot of people put on weight because it's cold. So for cattle, it's the same. If we are feeding them the same thing and we, they do not have very good forage, um, then they probably will be deficient in energy. So we need to take those things into consideration so that uh, we are supplementing additional feeds and energy and protein uh, when they need it the most. Then in Kentucky, our beef production are largely based on the pasture. So we want to make the most use of our pasture resource. And then um, how do we do that? We want to first test the forage to see if we have very good quality forage. Then if we absolutely have to supplement because our forage is not so good um, sometime, then we can go and buy additional feed. But if we maximize the use of the pasture we already have, then we can control the cost. Um, oops. Okay, so here um, I have a graph showing how much energy and protein um, the animals require when they are at different production stages. Um, so we can see that um, mature cows, they're milking, 
with the uh, highest milk production, they require the highest uh, energy and protein. So the uh, black bars on the left side are the en energy requirement, and the yellow, oh sorry, the uh, green bars are the protein requirement. So the milking cows require more energy and protein, and that makes sense, right? If we think about it, uh, if a cow is producing 20 pounds of milk per day, uh, with 5% of lactose in the milk, then the cow is literally dumping out one pound of sugar per day from the milk, from the mammary gland. So this is an example I borrowed from Dr. Lei. I think that's a very good demonstration, like that's a bag of sugar we get from the milk. And at the same time, the milk is also very abundant in protein and fat. That means um, the animals will need to get additional protein and um, energy from the milk, from the ration, in order to provide that um, energy and protein for the milk synthesis. That's why the milk um, high, the milk in producing cows will have higher energy and protein requirement um, compared to the dry cows. So for dry cows, um, they have relatively lower energy and protein requirement. But um, dry cows in their third trimester, um, when they're in the late pregnancy state, because they are actively growing in the fetus, so they will also need additional energy and protein requirement. So production stage largely affects the requirements of the animals. So if we um, take what I have um, mentioned in the previous slide, in consideration, so when, we, when animals are producing milk, they need additional energy and protein. When they are actively growing, they need more uh, requirements. And when they are um, in the last trimester of the pregnancy, that's also when they need additional energy and protein. So um, also when the weather is pretty cold, they also need additional energy. Um, but when the animals are mature, and dry, and then their mid gestation period. That's um, when they have the lowest requirements. So what we can do is, um, if you have a field of pasture, and then some of the pasture may be very good in quality, some of them may be not so good in quality, right? Then you can put your highest um, energy requirement animals in the superior pasture, while you can keep your dry, non-lactating animals in the pasture with uh, moderate or you know lower quality. Okay, so in addition to the production stages, environmental stressors also affect their nutrient requirements. So in the summer, we want to avoid um, the heat stress. So we want to provide shade and cool water uh, to help the animals stay cool. And in the summer, the animals, they do not eat much because they want to avoid the heat stress. So you may want to also supplement some um, additional feeds to, to help them um, with their energy status. And in the winter, cold stress um, will increase their energy requirements. So in the winter, we want to supplement additional um, energy supplements to help them stay warm. So let's say uh, if next week the temperature is going to drop drastically, and you know because you are checking the weather forecast, then you probably want to start increasing uh, how much you are giving to your cattle so that um, by the time the cold stress is here, they can stay relatively warm. And you can also divide the feed um, into two rations and feed them additional feed in the evening so that they can stay warm throughout the night. Okay, so to design a very good nutrition program, we want to make the most use of our forage. So we want to test our forage once in a while because if our forage is very good in quality, then we probably would be okay without additional uh, like corn or soybean supplementation, right? If they're already very good. But if the quality is not so good, then we need to plan for uh, purchasing additional feeds so that um, you know, when the animals are in crucial periods, like in a late pregnancy or they're lactating, they're not um, hurt by the deficiency of energy and protein in their diet. And um, the hay testing is pretty cheap. If you contact any uh, hay testing lab, it's probably 10 to $20 per sample. But um, if you find out later because you have an abortion in your herd, um, because of poor nutrition, then that could pay for a lot of hay testing. So at KSU, we have uh, accumulated some data on forage um, testing results of fescue hay. 
So you can see that if you focus on the third column, the CP, that's the crude protein. And you can see in some years, like 2011, the protein concentration was below 6%. And in some other years, um, like 2010, uh, we have protein level 13.4%. So that's very excellent um, protein level. So the same thing for the TDN, that's the energy level. So some years it's like 32%, and some other years it's pretty good 50%. Even within the same year, for example, in 2010, um, we get two batches of sample, but um, some one batch has only 7.9% of protein, but the other batch had 13.4%. Um, so that's just um, to show like how variable the, the forage quality could be. That's why we want to test um, the forage once in a while so that we know um, how to supplement when we need to supplement. Okay, so if we have poor quality um, forage and we do not have enough sometimes, then we can buy some additional silage and hay. Um, so when you buy that, we should ask for nutritional analysis and make sure that um, those hay we are buying are not high in nitrate because high nitrate can cause nitrate poisoning. And um, high nitrate is especially a problem in um, drought-stressed plants like um, oat grains, barley grains. So in, in Kentucky, sometimes we have drought. Then the next year or the you know, following winter, when you're buying the hay and the forage, you want to be very careful about the nitrate levels in the hay. So energy and protein are the most common considerations when we design a supplementation program. So most often, what we need to supplement is because we have a deficiency in protein or energy um, after we test the hay samples. And um, protein supplementation can, can be quite expensive. So uh, we want to make sure that the protein supplementation we are buying are not very high in non-protein nitrogen, like urea and ammonia. So ruminant animals, they can use non-protein nitrogen to some extent. But um, if it's too high, then they cannot use the excessive amount of non-protein nitrogen. So when protein supplementation is needed, when we have a forage or pasture that is very low in protein, then um, we should definitely consider supplementing the protein. Because protein supplementation, they do not only provide protein, they also improve the growth of the rumen bugs. And the rumen bugs are uh, what digest the, the forage, the fibers. So by providing the um, protein, we can also improve the fiber digestibility, the uh, forage utilization. So some studies have shown that when you feed um, more, like when you supplement protein, uh, you can also improve forage digestibility and forage intake. So that's the most important thing um, to consider when you have to supplement, because protein supplementation also improves the energy status of the animals because they can consume more forage and they can also make better use of the forage. So corn, um, sorry, commercial protein supplements, soybean meal, um, cow gluten feeds, those are some excellent um, protein supplementation. And when energy supplementation is needed, um, this is one we need to be very careful because um, we want to supplement something with high fermentable fiber instead of high starch. So many people, uh, we may think, okay, so my uh, hay quality is bad, then I will just throw in some corn. So that makes sense, right? Because that's energy, that's a very good resource. But if you think about it, um, corn has very high starch. And starch and forage, you know, rumen bacteria compete with each other. So when you feed a lot of starch, then the starch digesting bacteria will increase in population in the rumen. And at the same time, your forage, your fiber digesting bacteria will reduce in population in the rumen. So when you feed a lot of starch, like a lot of corn, then that could cause a problem because you can decrease the forage utilization and also forage intake. That's why uh, we prefer soybean hulls, uh, wheat millings, or corn gluten feed. They're very high in energy, but they're not very high in uh, starch so that they do not negatively affect the digestibility of forage. So when we buy those supplements, uh, we also want to uh, buy them based on the price per unit of protein and price per unit of energy. 
um, so that you can make the most use of your money because you don't want to pay for additional fiber because your forage is high in fiber. You do not need the additional um, fiber like to, to you don't want, you don't want to spend money on that. Okay, so in terms of mineral and vitamin supplementation, so we recommend to have a, always have a good uh, mineral supplementation. So the easiest way to do that is to purchase a commercial uh, mineral block or some loose minerals. Um, and in terms of vitamins, um, vitamin A is the only vitamin that needs to be supplemented. Um, so if you have cattle that graze on dry pasture during the summer for a long time, or your cattle are consuming um, dry forage or hay in the winter for a long time, then they will probably be deficient in vitamin A in the spring. Then you can um, buy uh, minerals with vitamin A in it, or you can give them some vitamin A injections. And the animals can store vitamin A in their fat tissue so that they can use it for like four to six months even after the injection. So that's about uh, mineral and vitamin supplementation. So in summary, to design a nutrition program, first we want to find out the nutrient requirements of your animals. And we talk about um, there are several ways to find that. We just need to know how much, uh, how much energy we need, how much protein we need in the diet. Um, you can look for extension publications, or you can look for the, um, for the numbers in the NRC, nutrient requirements uh, for, of beef cattle, the textbook. And um, just to keep in mind that when animals are actively growing or in, they're in the late pregnancy state or they are um, milking a lot of milk, that's when they need the most of energy and protein. So we want to um, give some additional energy and protein during that phase or we'll give them the best quality pasture for them to graze on. Then in the winter, they will also need some additional um, energy to stay warm then if we do not have very good um, pasture or forage, then we may want to consider supplementing um, protein or energy sources, right? So in the, if, we are, if we do not have a, a forage with very good protein, so the most important thing is to supplement a good protein supplementation because that does not only provide the protein, that also improves their forage intake and utilization. So it's like, we are supplementing protein, but we are also supplementing uh, energy indirectly. While for the energy supplementation, we want to um, provide um, feed with high fermentable sources, high fermentable fibers like um, soybean hulls instead of corn because we do not want to negatively impact the forage digestibility and intake because the high starch uh, will reduce the forage digestibility. But sometimes when you do not have other uh, feeds, corn is okay, but you do not want to overfeed. Maybe you can limit it to like four pounds to six pounds, depends on how big your cows um, are. So, but for, um, you, you do want to be consistent in providing the energy supplementation because you do not want to feed like 20 pounds per day, then you skip the next few days. That will completely disturb the rumen function. Um, but if you have energy, if you have protein supplementation, it's okay to do it uh, once or twice per week because animals are very efficient in utilizing the energy and they will maintain the same performance. Um, okay, so in addition, the clean water and minerals should always um, be available. And water is something people often forgot, but water is crucial for their intake and for their health and we should always um, ensure they have water. Sometimes in the winter, the water can be frozen. We may want to use some heat element um, in your water bowls to make sure that they always have water. Okay, so that's uh, what I have here. Uh, my, my email address will be posted at the end of the presentation. If you have any questions or you want to uh, request the resources I mentioned, um, I will be happy to share. So thank you, David. All right, so I'm going to be talking to you today, today about um, small-scale dairy, dairy farming for the homesteading setting. So I grew up on a dairy farm that had over 150 to 200 head, and we ran anywhere from between the early 1900s up until 2002 when we finally had to get out. 
little more different setting than what you guys are here to learn about, but I've tried to scale it down and I'm gonna be giving you um, a couple of pointers on how to kind of scale it down for what you're setting. So first of all, why do dairy? Well, your reasons are your own. Maybe you wanna go back to the basics of having closer to raw milk, less processed, because there is a lot of research on that that says there's a lot of benefits to it, especially if you're a parent and you kinda of want your kids to have that nutritional value that closer to not as heavily processed milk as like what you buy in the store. And that's okay. There, the research varies greatly. You'll see some benefits, you'll see the cons, but either way, I would encourage you to do your research. And above all else, you need to think about if you do pick up on dairy, dairy cattle are like Dr. Jung and Dr. Young or uh, Dr. Lay said, very different from beef cattle. You know, beef cattle are raised basically for their body. You raise them up to a certain point, to a certain weight, and then they're sent off to die. Dairy cattle, you're gonna be keeping for most of their life because their sole purpose for you is the production of milk. So even if you get just one cow for your own use, just to have that milk, you gotta be thinking about the costs that are gonna be incurred to keep that cow, to keep her producing, and also with what you need to have on hand to process the milk into various products that you're gonna want for your own self. So you have a variety of products you can get from dairy milk, you know, milk, cheese, yogurt. There's various ways to produce these. Now, you're, you can get online. Google and YouTube have people giving you all kinds of tips on how to produce a lot of these products. Um, but it ultimately comes down to choice. But I would encourage you to do your research on where you get your stuff. Now, of course, that's what we serve. We at Extension know how to find, how to sift through the chaff, so to speak, so that you don't have to sit there and try to figure out well, what's fact and what's not. So if you have questions about this stuff, consult with your Extension agents. Consult with your USDA people, because they're gonna be able to tell you, well, this process does work, but here are the drawbacks. But either way, you have a variety of things that you can get out of dairy, and there's tons of benefits that come with it. Things to consider though, you're gonna need a fair amount of land needed. Every cow needs about approximately one to two acres of land for grazing. Now, you can raise maybe on a little smaller than that, but you kind of want to keep that in mind and stick close to that number because you're also gonna to wanna to be thinking about the land needing to be healed. All right, dairy cattle are, like I said, they're constantly producing milk. They're constantly needing nutrient intake. And so they graze very, very heavily and they will take one acre in no time and they will clean it clear. So you also wanna keep in mind the amount of land that you're needing and your management of that land so that it has the greatest output value both for your cow and for, your, and for the land's ability to heal. You also wanna keep in mind that you're gonna need certain facilities. You're gonna need at least some shelter for them and you will need to have some sort of milking and processing facility to get to, so that you can get the product and then go through and process it to your own use. You have to think about the cost of feed, any equipment that you need, milking equipment, um, buckets, sanitation, you know, cleaners, things like that, all of that, any supplies that you need. You're also gonna have fees, insurance, and taxes to take into consideration. And then above all else, you have to know your regs. Your regulations, you know, even you as a personal consumer, there are some regulations that are out there when you're dealing with dairy that you need to keep in mind. They're not many, but mostly those, re mostly those regulations deal with distribution, sales, and processing. But you still wanna know your stuff. And again, if you have questions on that, please feel free to contact any of us and we'll help guide you in the direction you need to go. So with land, like I said, you need about one to two acres per cow. You need to have proper fencing, all right? Cows like to wander. 
We recommend woven wire. It's the most secure and the best way to deader outside predators because you do have to consider we do live in an area where coyotes are frequent and a coyote, a pack of coyotes do frequent cow pastures. They're not afraid to take on a full grown 1200 pound cow. So you want to take into consideration that and also securing your cow in your pasture because like Mr. Harn had said with the pigs, you don't want the cow wandering onto somebody else's property. Board fence is another one. You got to keep in mind size of the cow. Cows weigh anywhere from 1,200 to 1,500 pounds when full grown and a dairy cow is no different. Some dairy can get up to even higher than that. But so board fence is another option. It's a little higher in price. So that's why we tend to recommend the woven wire, but it's still an option for you if, you wanna, if you'd rather go with that. Um, the, you also may want to consider some extra deterrence. Do not use barbed wire fence complete, you know, totally for your operation, securing your cattle, because you have to take in mind that if cattle try to challenge that fence, that udder could get snagged on the barbed wire, and then you have prone to infection, you have damage to your product maker. You know, you wanna keep that udder in as good a condition as possible. But I threw it up there because when, if you do do a woven wire or a um, board fence, one single strand of barbed wire along the top, good deer deterrent because deer, as we all know, have a very high jump radius. And you do want to keep them out of your pastures because there are some diseases that can be carried over to your dairy cattle, not much, but you still want to have that option. And then electric fence is also good. Just one single strand down at the bottom will usually keep them from challenging your fence. Um, you do want to go with a fairly high voltage because cows have a thick hide and it's gonna take a lot for them to get the message across. If you do go with electric fence, make sure that you keep the grass trimmed around it because you don't want the grass growing up so high that it grounds out your fence. You lose charge. It's not doing anything but sitting there as a decoration. And then you wanna also, I would also say consider a little extra acreage for rotational grazing. Like I said, cows are heavy, dairy cattle are heavy grazers. If you have at least another, at least one to two acres, you can take the cow off the one acre when the grass starts to get thinned out, put her on the next. That gives a chance for the grass to grow back on your one pasture. Let's the manure set in and fertilize and like I said, heal the land. Grazing versus feed. I'm not gonna get too much into this because you already heard a lot about that from Dr. Lay and Dr. Zhang. Um, but for small scale, scale dairy, um, you know, grazing is great. We want our cattle to graze. You want your dairy cows to graze. That grass has a lot of the nutrients they need, but it doesn't have everything they need. One thing I will point out, selenium. In dairy cattle, dairy cattle need a high um, amount of the trace mineral selenium because it helps not only with milk quality, but it also is necessary to keep down any issues with birthing. Um, one of the biggest things that occurs in selenium deficiency in dairy cattle is the retainment of placenta, which can lead to infection. So uh, when you get your feed, we rec I recommend using a good supplemental feed and make sure that it has your trace, a good amount of trace mineral selenium. Um, trace mineral salt mix is usually a good all around supplemental feed to give your dairy cattle. And you wanna make sure they have a steady supply of it on hand in front of them throughout the year. Um, always check, it, it's best when you're grazing to check your grass quality. Um, I don't know, I can't remember if anybody's touched on this, but UK has a lab that if you take samplings of your grass off your pasture acre, um, you can send it off to be tested for the amount of nutrients the, or the trace amount of nutrients that it has in your grass. I think the test is $25, I'm not sure, but if you need to find out, contact me, I will find out for you. And then, especially in the winter months, you're gonna need hay, all right? I know that the last couple of years we haven't had much winter, but they do occur. Snow comes, there isn't much grass out there. So you wanna make sure that you stock up on your hay in, uh, for your winter months. Um, cattle can consume anywhere from 100 pounds a day to higher than that. It just depends on the cow. 
So you want to get a good amount of square bales available so that, and I say square bales, in your case, if you're only raising one to two cattle, you don't want a full size round bale, all right, a four foot by four foot bale. Because that's when, like Dr. Lay said, you're going to start needing to consider getting a tractor or other type of lifting equipment. You're not going to be able to lift that. You're also, with the round bale, if you've only got one or two cattle, you're going to have a lot of waste. And that's money down the drain for you. So be sure if you're going to buy supplemental hay, have that tested. See if you're getting good quality. And just make sure that it's the right kind of stuff for you. Water is key for dairy cattle. Dairy cattle are gonna consume a lot of water, all right? We all know, something that maybe not a lot of you know, but a gallon of milk, uh, when you're milking or in the dairy world, milking is measured by pounds. So a cow on average, like you probably saw, um, I think Dr. Lay may have touched on it or not, but normal dairy cow output, is an average of 90 pounds uh, a day. So convert that, a gallon of milk weighs 8.6 pounds. So that's 10 gallons a day that she's putting out. That's, you know, approximately five of those jugs. Uh, and I may have done my math wrong and I'm sorry. But either way, that's a lot of water she's putting out into her milk. So she needs a lot of water. Make sure you have a steady supply of good, clean water available for your dairy cow. And you wanna have good, clean water sources for that. So if you get waters, you wanna make sure that they're always clean of debris. Dairy cows, when they're grazing or when they're eating, they get a lot of feed stuff on them and then they go to drink and then that stuff sits in there and it collects algae. Every now and then, go in there and clean out your waters. That helps keep down the bacteria, and it also helps to freshen out their water for you to you know, keep them in good health. Be mindful if you have ponds and lakes. As you know, these build up bacteria. Cows, they love to go out and they love to just stand in the water. Well, if they're standing there, they're urinating and defecating in that water source nonstop. You also have other animals probably going in there and doing the same thing. So don't really recommend um, using a pond or a lake as a primary water source, but if you do, test your water, make sure that there's not a high level of harmful bacteria in it that's gonna harm your dairy cows. And above all else, water needs to be accessible to them. So make sure that you don't have a lot of trash around like an outside water source or any other obstructions for them. Facilities, above all, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have good shelter. It needs to offer, um, dairy cows have a pretty good thick hide, so they can sustain some pretty cold temperatures, but the hot temperatures is where your problem is. And so you wanna make sure that you have a good shaded area, at least something like this, or even a hoop barn with you know, a good shade cloth over it is a good enough shelter if they're out grazing out in the pasture. And then your normal holding facilities, like if you have a small barn, um, you wanna make sure that that's kept clean. You wanna make sure that it has good airflow. And you wanna make sure that um, above all else, it's providing good shelter from like your storms and uh, you know, wind, just different types of elements that could cause harm. Your milking area, your parlor. So I've got here an example of someone took one of those, like the sheds you buy from the Amish or the Mennonites, and they converted it into a little small dairy parlor. This is just one example of something you can do on your own to set up for something small scale. If you have, uh, if you do set something else uh, up, something up on your own, some things you need to consider, you need to have secure holding for your cow, all right? Cattle are not gonna just stand there and let you fool around underneath them. They're gonna dance around, they're gonna probably kick you, they'll kick your bucket if you're milking into a bucket, you know, they, they're very active. So you kinda wanna have something that'll keep them confined, um, just so that they're not moving and dancing around as much. You may also want to have some, like a low bar um, around their legs so that they're not kicking you or kicking, your, um, kicking the milker if you have something like the setup I, set, I showed you earlier. Or 
of course, your bucket. Um, so something like, even if you just set up like a pallet um, around them, that's something that you can that you can do that's fairly cheap and also helps you in the long run. Um, if you use something like a head chute, like you saw earlier that Dr. Lay showed, um, you're gonna. This is where you're gonna want to set up some kind of sub, you know, a feed source in front of them, because if you put them through the chute once, they're gonna know that something's up any repeated time after that. It's gonna make milking harder. So you kinda of wanna give them something to encourage them to go to that area and just keep them busy while you're up underneath them and getting the milk. <clears throat> something you wanna also know, um, it, everything you have in that dairy potter has to be cleaned and sanitized after every use. Even doing it before is much better than just doing it the once because I will say this now, selling of raw, I'm gonna iterate this several times. The selling of raw milk, selling and distribution of raw milk, at least interstate, is federally prohibited. Every state, as far as selling it goes, has their own regulations. Again, if you don't know or don't know where to go, um, contact us. But USDA has, for every state, has a section in it that tells you the regulations for selling and distribution of raw milk products. But either way, part of those regulations, they emphasize that you need to keep your facilities cleaned and sanitized. Um, there's a lot of good uh, dairy grade sanitize, sanitizing um, products out there. You wanna just make sure to keep your buckets, your milk pail clean. Um, clean your milker if you use a portable milking machine after every use. Just sanitation is key. Different breeds, different milk qualities. So when you're going through and you're picking what kind of cat, dairy cattle do I want to have? There are all kinds of differences. There's differences in size, there's differences in behavior, there's differences in milk output differences in the content of the milk. So like Jersey is well known for being high in the butterfat content and that's why they're a very popular breed. It's a very rich milk. But the reason Holstein is so popular in the dairy world is because they are known for high volume output. They are your big milk producers. But every breed has good qualities that are also good for consideration. Brown Swiss are really good milkers they tend to when you if once you get their routine routine down it's like clockwork for them they'll go right in they'll get milked and they'll, they'll be the first ones back out to graze so it does come down to you, what you want versus preference and if you can find the right balance for that you're doing great Keeping a bull versus AI. Most dairy, like beef, does AI. Now, if you, a cow's open period for, um, for conception is 83 days. Gestation after conception is 282 days. If you're gonna do a bull, of course, everybody loves nature's what, like Dr. Lay said, nobody does it better than nature. However, the bull's a different story. The bull doesn't always know what he's doing. And I have seen bulls try to do their business from the wrong end. So it's not always a, it's not always a guarantee of conception. Bulls are usually kept for, um, in big operations for what they call cleanup. So they'll go in Usually after AI, they'll turn the bull loose in with cows who have been AI'd and they'll go in and help reassure the insemination takes. Um, but some things you've got to consider if you're going to keep a bull. A dairy bull is one of the meanest animals on the face of this earth. All right, It is a 1,200 pound tank that will mow you down in a blink of an eye. Um, I've had classes um, several times throughout my life that talked about do not make a pet out of a bull because bulls will turn on you very quickly. So that's something that you've got to keep in mind if you're going to keep that animal on your property. Um, they do pose a threat not only to people but to other animals. 
And so that's one of the things why, you know, Dr. Lay was saying we usually go for pulled. All right, you imagine that 1,200 pound tank with two good shiny horns on his head, bulls fight. Bulls fight themselves, bulls will fight other cows. I've even seen bulls, you know, do some damage to baby calves. They just, they are a very aggressive animal. And so you kind of want to keep in consideration. That's another thing where breed kind of comes into play. Some breed bulls are less aggressive than others, but this is where your research comes into play. So we usually talk AI. However, even though AI is a much safer and greater chance of conception, it does have its drawbacks, all right? You need the appropriate facilities. You do need a head shoot. Like I said, it goes back to the holding thing um, with milking. You need to have a way to secure the cow because you're gonna be fishing your arm uh, up, up the hole to go in and put your straw in and do the inception. So you need to have good equipment that's gonna hold her while she does that. More often than not, if you don't know how to do it yourself, it does require an AI um, certified technician, veterinarian, and more often than not, if you do it yourself, you will have to get certified to do it before you can get turned loose to do it yourself. So those are just some things to consider if you're gonna go the AI route. You have a calf, what do you do with it? Well, like Dr. Lay said, you can sell it for veal. Um, a lot of people are doing crossbreeding to, um, to get, like when they're, when they're going through with their cows to breed them and get them started in milking again, they'll crossbreed them with beef so that the calf that comes out, they can just sell it for beef and you get better milk quality. I'm not gonna lie, dairy cow meat is nasty. It is about the chewiest thing you could put in your mouth next to bubble gum. But um, that's just one option that'll help give you a better quality product if you're just gonna turn around and sell them. Another thing though to keep in mind when you're getting calves is your dairy cow, it's a living animal. All living animals die. Eventually you're gonna, ha you're gonna get a cow that's so old, she's not gonna be producing as much anymore and she's gonna have a lot of wear and tear on her body, she's gonna get slow. So you need to th be thinking about replacement. So when you're going through, you get a calf and you let it grow to a certain point, consider, well, how old's my cow that she came out of? How old's the rest of my cows that I have if I have more than one? Um, look at the quality of the calf. There's ways to judge how good of a calf is um, once it reaches a certain point in age. Usually about a year or two after it's born is a good time to really go through and judge on conformity to see if it's gonna be a good replacement. Again, research, consult us, we will help you make those determinations. The calf will need colostrum the first 24 hours. So colostrum is produced as soon as the calf is born. You do not want to put that in with your actual product that you're going to sell or consume. All right, so the first 24 hours you milk that cow. If you don't, you don't want to dump it necessarily, but you need to keep at least some for your calf within the first 24 hours. The rest, you're going to toss it. After that, you're going to want to wean the, the calf at a minimum of eight weeks in. You can turn it, you can keep it in with the mother. However, like Dr. Lay said, you might not necessarily want that calf eating your product. Another thing to keep in mind, that calf, um, calves are born with their teeth. They have a row of bottom teeth and they are very sharp and most calves are very aggressive uh, suckers. And so that's putting a lot of wear and tear on that teat. So might be a better choice to use milk replacer. And there's all kinds of brands and products out there. Um, Land of Lakes makes a really great one in my personal um, experience. It's very rich and butter uh, has a good amount of butter fat in it, but it's name brand. So how do you know? Well, should I get name brand or should I not? Read your label. Read your label, compare the two products, and see what you can get for a better price. Like I said, there's tons of options out there. Milking. So. This is an image of the lactation curve. Lactation period is typically 305 days from calving to the point that you need to dry off your cow. 
All right, it needs to be done at least twice a day. Like I said, cows are putting out 90 pounds of milk per day. A gallon of milk weighs 8.6 pounds. That's approximately 10 gallons per day. And this is also where you need to think about storage. All right, any storage containers that you get, if you get one that's not buckets and you're gonna keep them in a fridge, stainless steel. Um, you, if you're going to get a cow, usually you don't need a thousand, uh, unless you have multiple cows, you don't need a thousand gallon stainless steel tank like most places do. If you can find something that's food grade stainless steel and can hold up to, let's say, uh, 500 gallons, I mean, that's, that's a pretty good thing. Uh, I will be glad to help you research and try to find something if you're interested in something like that, but there's options out there. You're going to watch for signs of bacterial infection. So one of the main uh, problems in dairy cattle is mastitis. Mastitis is a bacterial infection that gets up into the udder, up through the teat, and it can cause clumping and souring of your milk. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but it's mostly prevalent in feces, so if you're having a lot of problems with mastitis in your dairy cows, check the area that they're frequenting. You want to keep the feces level down. You want to keep the filth down. So just keep your stuff clean. And then before you do start milking, each time you're going to strip the teat. So you're going to do two quick squirts on the teat, check the quality of milk. Um, is it clumpy? Is the milk clear? Does the udder feel hard? These are signs of mastitis or some other bacterial infection. And then, of course, you're also going to check, is there any cuts, scars? Um, is there any uh, lumps or bumps around the teats? This is just the point where you're going to check to make sure, hey, I don't want to put anything bad in my milk. Uh, prior to milking, you're going to use a pre and post-dip post the teat every milking. So what that does is it's an alternative to just washing off the udder before and after milking. Uh, just like these are examples of some teat dip cups that you can get. You fill it up. Uh, usually teat dip comes in an iodine form, a food grade iodine. You just dip the teat, wipe it down, and you're ready to go. And then after you milk, you're going to dip it in, an, in a post dip. Usually it's like a, just a coating that keeps the teat, uh, that helps clean it off and also helps to kind of heal it after the milking process. Because milking does put a strain on your teat skin. Uh, you do not want to milk, like I said, you don't want to milk a cow when fresh. So that first 24 hours, the milk that you get, she is going to need to be milked. You just want to dump that milk if you're not going to give it to your calf. And then after milking, you're going to take your milk and you need to at least pasteurize it. Right? Pasteurization is very important, especially if you're going to go and distri distribute and sell it to the general public. You're going to do what's called batch pasteurization. And that's where you're going to put the milk into a large stainless steel vat and heat it up to a minimum of 145 degrees Fahrenheit for a minimum of 30 minutes. This will kill off all of the harmful bacteria without damaging the milk quality or without destroying all the good bacteria that can be found in the milk. And I'll go ahead and I've talked about all that. So the dry off period, that's when you're not milking. So this gives time for the udder to heal and for the body to kind of regain all the nutrients that it's lost in all the heavy milking. You're gonna do this 60 days prior to the, at least prior to the cow's next calving. Um, now you can treat your cows to complete the dry off, but it's not necessary. You can use like a teat sealant application. They do make that, but it's not really necessary. You do want to make sure though that you treat your udder, and especially in the winter time, for chapping. They make what's called bag balm. You just rub that around the teat skin and underneath and around the udder. Helps to kind of keep the moisture in and keep it from drying out, cracking, chapping, and also keeps the bacterial infection down. Products. Like I said, if you get it, depending on what you're going to want to use, you're going to need to consider the milk, uh, the equipment you're going to want for what, what you're going to do with your products. So like if you're just doing milk, you will need a pasteurizer. You might need a bottling machine or a jug machine. You're going to need storage. So you're, depending on your volume, you're going to need a storage tank, 
or at least buckets and a very large refrigerator to keep that in until it's come until it's time to collect. Uh, the other products, it just depends. So, there, like I said, there's a variety of options for you out there as far as making cheese, uh, cottage cheese, ice cream. Uh, this is just where you're going to want to do your research. Don't be afraid to get out there on Google or YouTube and see what other people are doing. There's a lot of good tips out there and tricks. There's a lot of stuff that you can do at home with the stuff you already have. It's just uh, just where you're going to need to kind of look around and see what's best for you. USDA, like I said, heavily regulates the sale of milk and dairy products. You want to do your research. Consult your local USDA inspector. They will know the regulations and especially if you're going to resell to the public, you're especially want to going to consult them. Um, to let you know what you can what you can do and what you can't do, they will also help you set up a facility um, based on your needs and what you want to do. So they'll kind of not just be somebody who tells you what the regulations are; they can also be your guide in setting up your own little dairy farm um, to the spec that you kind of want. Um, I've included this slide. This is an example of a group that builds micro dairy. They custom build it. Um, I think the average he has done, he said he, as far as I know, he started setting it up in trailer form, but he also does, I think, hard um, base facilities. He can do it anywhere from 15 to 25,000, depending on that. But you don't necessarily have to go this route. I'm just including this as an example of somebody you can do. There's tons of ways out there that you can set up a micro dairy for your own personal use, let alone for resale and distribution of your own products. Like I said, research, research, research. If you do not know where to go, that's where we come in. Feel free to contact me at any time and I will help do the research for you. And with that. I think we're going to open it up for questions from Dr. Lay, Dr. Yang, and um, Mr. Bob Harnett as well um, to take general questions. Um, could you speak a little bit about a miniature dairy cow and what's your kind of your opinion on that? The question is miniature dairy cow and what is my opinion on it? So miniature dairy is fairly new to the United States. And uh, when I say new, I don't mean that they've not always been here. I just mean that you're... For the most part, you had maybe one or two in the entire United States that had them. So there's not really a whole lot out there that I have found on them. Um, the only thing that I would have in consideration as far as the miniature dairy cows is you're not going to get as high of output as with, you know, your normal breeds. Um, it's something that I'm still kind of learning about. But um, so, yeah, I... I'm not sure where that's going to go, whether it's going to be just another fad, you know, that comes and goes. Um, you know, your miniature breeds, of course, are going to be easier to handle. Again, it just comes down to what are you wanting as far as do you want personal use or are you wanting distribution and sales? Like I said, I would see like your yield and output not being so high. So that's one of those things where cost of the animal versus its return on investment is going to come into play. But that would be the only input I have at this time. I'm still learning on it myself. My question is also for you. Um, we are getting ready to do a home dairy cow and it will just be for our consumption, our family. 
Um, we have been researching and reading, and there are some people that suggest that you milk once a day and leave her with the calf the second time a day and don't milk two times. Is there a benefit or drawback to doing that? So the question, um, if nobody heard it, was um, as far as there's some things out there regarding uh, people are saying just milk once a day if you're, going, you're keeping a cow for personal use and then just letting the calf in. The drawback with that is depending, again, on your breed. Um, so like with a Holstein, she's a high volume output animal. She's going to probably output more milk than your calf will or you will consume. Um, so calf's not always going to drain out the milk. And when a cow, if a cow's not being milked at least twice a day, there's a lot of buildup in the udder. This opens her up to bacterial infection and even a lot of heavy wear on the udder. So some breeds don't have as high an output, and so you could get away with that. I think Guernsey and Ayrshire are your, are your, are your less. Um, but I really don't recommend it just because, you know, milking isn't just, you know, you're taking from the animal. It's also part of their health routine because it helps to drain it out of, uh, drain out all the old milk and kind of helps keep everything fresh and working internally. So, but again, it comes down to breed. Some you can get away with, some you can't. Um, and again, you also want to keep, even with your own personal consumption, like I said, the calf's putting a lot of wear and tear on it. And another thing I would say, baby calves are like any other babies. They like to experience the world through their mouth. So they're going around and they're putting everything they can in their mouth. You don't know what they're picking up. Now, they aren't as prone to like nasty bacterial buildup in their mouth as like some animals like humans but still you never know what they're going to put on the udder when they go to milk on mama so it's just kind of a general good all-around practice that you you can leave the calf on but just kind of keep an eye on the udder make sure you know watch for any abnormal signs on the udder and in the milk before you consume it just so that you know you don't put that back into your family system So my question is for Dr. Lay, but any of you guys will probably be able to answer it. So I am actually trying to put together a plan to um, fence 30, 35 acres of land. And I'm just wondering what would be best when you're talking about wooden fencing versus T, t post. Um, usually people will do like a wooden post, then a T post and so forth. but. Um, I guess, would it be best just to have wooden if you can afford it for one, and then what sizes, because there's different widths in them, and I just, I don't know much about that, so. For, for what animal? Cows. Um, so it's going to be cheaper to do the woven wire, and you can just do those standard four by six. Um, what they usually do is they'll do like a wooden post, then two T posts, and then a wooden post. That's going to be the cheapest way to go. Um, and like I said, cows do well on you know the perimeter, having just a woven wire. If you want, a lot of times they'll do a layer of barbed wire on top, um, but that's pretty standard for cows and it works pretty good. The wooden fences, of course, you know if you drove through Lexington, they're beautiful. Um, but lumber's not cheap, right? So, you know, so we're trying to do things economically and always keeping in mind, right? Um, like I said, you know, you don't want to put thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars into this when it's going to be, you know, the small scale. So keeping things practical, that's the easiest way to go. So I would do the woven wire around the outside with the perimeter, and then inside, it. Are you going to do cow, calf, or feeders? Or don't, not sure yet. Right, so, so yeah, that would be the next cheapest way to go, right? Because those electric fences, you know, if you've got cows, you can move them, 
right? Because with the electric fences, you can put them on the small, you know, little movable post, right? You'll still have them hooked to the electric box, but then move them as you go along, right? And when you were talking about internal fencing, worst case scenario, a tree falls on it and it's not hot for, you know, a couple of weeks. If they get out, they're still contained. But for the perimeter, I would just do that woven wire because um, it's probably going to be the cheapest way to go. Yeah. Are you, are you going to do this yourself or are you going to hire a contractor? Uh, probably me and my dad. And we'll the same amount of work goes into a cheapo thing. I would not cut corners. I would buy good wire and good post. So that when the posts rot off in a decade and start falling over, you're kind of thinking, wait a minute. So, uh, yes, this is something you don't want to go... We all want to be cost conscious, but perimeter fence built right and, and use good, good materials. wire uh, woven wire tends to be more prone to overgrowth so of course we live in an area where there's a lot of briar and rose bush and all kinds of just nasty weedy stuff that grows in and around the fence I've seen woven wire fence torn apart by briar bush time and time again good quality means it will hold up against that kind of abuse it will also hold up if again a tree falls down and crushes it it'll crush and destroy you know cheap woven wire so you want something that will also stand up against abuse of nature as well as um, still keep your animals maintained and contained I'll add something real quick to the fencing conversation the University of Kentucky Forage Extension Group has a really good um, fencing school that they do multiple times a year so you can keep your eyes peeled for that. I think they've got one coming up in April in Allen County, uh, April 11th, and there's still registration open for that. Forage extension, and they have a really good newsletter you can sign up for as well. You go ahead. So, wanted to get like, what is the average cost of like? A feeder like piglet um, and is there a list somewhere I mean you mentioned not going on to Craigslist and Facebook to find your piglets but is there a place where you can go to like find a list of people in your area that actually like we happened upon a guy who raised cattle and and was able to get a cow that way but there, there may be all kinds of lists out there I don't know where they are uh, you can google all those things up uh, breed associations may get you to to just not a lot of people raising pigs anymore yeah we sell feeder pigs off the farm someone in this room already sent me an email um so and so yeah you can look up breed associations the kentucky pork producers uh your extension service may all be uh leads on and um, we, we sell wean pigs eight weeks of age, dewormed off a of mama for $150. That's about a 40, 50 pound pig. That'll give you at least a price range. Yeah, this, this is just a general question. Um, some friends of mine, they had been discussing that, I don't know if it's the state or at the federal level that they're talking about uh, prohibiting the sale of uh, vaccines and and things like that, like your local tractor supplies and stuff like that. Have you guys heard of any truth about that or? Yeah, so that's a big thing. Um, so it's not vaccines. Vaccines, um, like your dewormers, you're still gonna be able to go to the feed store and get. All right, um, so this will apply for all species throughout, from out the whole day. So there's a new law starting in June no antibiotics are to be sold without um, the veterinary prescription, right? And so they did this with feet, putting antibiotics in the feet a couple years ago. I think it's 2015, right? So, you know, when I talked about antibiotics for a minute, I said, you know, antibiotics should never be 
a replacement for good management. Um, when they first came out with the feed directive, I was mad about it, right? Because as vets, we've always been regulated by the United States Department of Agriculture, right? Other farmers. And I was fine with that. This law comes from the FDA, the Human Food and Drug Administration, right? They're not farmers. They don't care. Their only concern is food getting into the human food chain, right? And what they found is a lot of overuse. When we, I talked about the withdrawal times, right? When you go to Tractor Supply and you bought, buy a bottle of penicillin, right? There's a 17 year old behind the counter. Does he tell you it's illegal to slaughter that animal for the next 28 days? He doesn't, does he? Right? Does anybody ever know if you do or not? Well, let's think about it this way. There are tons of people allergic to penicillin. So if the guy, that 17 year old behind the counter didn't tell you not to slaughter it, and you do, and there's penicillin in that meat, it could kill somebody, right? And honestly, when we start talking about sheep and goats, we don't even really know what the withdrawal times are. <laughs> I mean, it's true, and nothing's labeled for sheep and goats. But what that does is, as a veterinarian, it's throwing the liability back on me. If you come to my office and you buy a bottle of medicine, and I give it to you, and I say, do not slaughter this animal for 28 days. You take it to the stockyards on day 29 and sell it, you're not in trouble, I am, right? So what this is doing is make, opening up that conversation, right? Because being able to go buy antibiotics at Walmart, right? No one telling you how to use them, that's not responsible, right? It's really not. Now, a lot of farmers, right, you know, are responsible. You know, you've seen, you've had calves with pneumonia before, you know what the signs are, your calf gets pneumonia, and that's fine. Because if you have a relationship with your vet, right? You can't just call a vet that you've never seen before and be like, give me some drugs. It don't work. But if you know the vet, right, then you can call me and be like, hey, I've got an animal that's doing X, Y, and Z. And I'll be like, oh, that sounds like disease A, X, whatever. And I'll be like, I'll have my receptionist sit it out. And that also makes sure that you're using the correct medication because we talked about it. Right, and we can still do telemedicine, so we can still do a phone consult, and me have the girls at the office set it out, right? So it's not like, oh, I've got to, you know, we're not going to try and charge you an arm and a leg. What we're doing is make sure you use the correct antibiotic, right? And then the liability is getting thrown back to the veterinarian. 